So the Chazonish is telling us when a man is accustomed to being meticulous in the observance of halacha, in opposition to his natural and inborn tendencies, this accustoms him to have his deep understanding rule and his intellect control him. What does that mean? That means if a person submits to the law of God in opposition to his natural and inborn tendencies, where a person has natural inclination, a natural inclination to be aggressive, a natural inclination to get what he wants or what she wants right now without any patience, a natural inclination to just simply get whatever they want, regardless of how many people they step on on their way, a natural inclination to believe whatever they read without necessarily double checking, a natural inclination to just want without necessarily giving, a natural inclination to be arrogant, a natural inclination to be selfish, a natural inclination to be lazy. And oh, that's a big problem in this generation. Nonetheless, the person that takes advantage of the law of the Torah and observes the halacha that's in opposition of his inborn tendencies, in opposition of his natural tendencies, all the things that you were born with and all the things that you trained yourself to be like, When you're a little kid, you want everything for you. Me, 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 everything is me. You want to, somebody says, oh, can I have a little bagel that you have? Can I have a little popcorn that you have? Can I have a little candy you have? No, it's mine, it's mine. A person is born selfish. They want everything for themselves. As they grow up, they realize if they're gonna get along with society, if they're gonna be a good husband, if they're gonna be a good employee, if they're gonna be a good coworker, if they're gonna be good, period, they have to share. A person that doesn't know how to work with other people, a person that doesn't know how to delegate, a person that doesn't know how to share is not a good person. Why? Because this is part of giving into the world. Giving of yourself, giving of your time, and even more so, giving something to somebody else that's better than you to do the job for the better good, for the greater good of society, of the company, of whatever cause you're fighting for. So a person has these natural inclinations they're born with, but also they have inclinations that they actually develop themselves. Why? Due to their nurture, their their surroundings. They were surrounded by a bunch of hoodlums. They were surrounded by drug addicts and drug dealers. They were surrounded by people that were materialistic. They were surrounded by people that only cared about the physique rather than caring about the intellect. They cared about only about money rather than care about helping. So these are the things that a person develops based on where they grew up. I grew up around a bunch of hoodlums. And guess what? I chose not to be a hoodlum. I chose not to be a hoodlum. Why? Because even though I played football and I played and I had a lot of friends that were black and Spanish and all types of backgrounds and this is the reason why I don't see color and I care less for racism. The reality is a bunch of the people that I went to high school with and junior high school with ended up being hoodlums. They were hoodlums back then. They ended up being hoodlums in their life. Why? They chose that way. We both went to the same school. We both got the same exact education. One of us chose to be something better than what he was and the others chose to be losers. Why? Because that's the way they thought. Oh, because I grew up here and I went to Port Richmond High School and I and I and I didn't grow up with a lot of this and a lot of that. Therefore, I'll be this. This is an excuse. Nonsense. If you want to succeed in life, Akadosh Bahu will give you the opportunity. The choice is yours, regardless of what skin color you have and what background you have. There are plenty of people that were poor and became rich. There are plenty of people that were rich and became poor. There are plenty of people that were black, white, and burgundy that started one way, ended up another way. This Rabotai Karim is important for every single person that is watching this to know you have no excuse to fail other than the excuse you feed yourself in your mind. That's the only excuse. There's no actual valid excuse. It doesn't make a difference where you grew up in and how many troubles you had and whether you were a drug addict and whether your mother died and whether you were dealing and whether you were buying and whether you were selling. It does not make a difference. A person needs to take themselves in their hands and choose wisely. That's why the Torah says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us the Torah to live by the law, not to die by it. Meaning, you have the law, the law is going to help you live life for eternity, not just die with some excuse for a life. And this is unfortunately one of the things that a lot of people like to make excuses for themselves. 
Oh, I didn't make it in life because I grew up in the projects. I didn't make it in life because my father is not a rabbi. I didn't make it in life because I didn't grow up religious. I didn't make it in life because you know I grew up over here. I didn't make it in life because of all this nonsense. I've seen all types of people succeed and fail and it was always their choosing. If you choose to do the things that are necessary for success, you will succeed. Now, success is not defined by money. Sometimes a person thinks that success only means money, but there are plenty of people that are extremely successful without having a fortune of money. But if you ask them, they're as happy as can be. They have the ultimate goal that every billionaire aspires to have, which is actual happiness. Some people do have money, but yet they're miserable. Some people have both. They have money and happiness. Some people have both, which is money and misery. The key is to understand that if you want to reach a higher goal, that means you have to work for it. It's not going to come to you easy. But the problem today is that we have an ideological defect in society where people don't understand how to get to their goals. And one of the reasons is, is because they don't even know what their goal is supposed to be. They have a goal, but it's the wrong goal. It's a phantom goal. And we're going to get to that in a moment, Bezalat Hashem. Now, one of the flaws in society today is that people want to be these celebrities. They want to be the LeBron James, the Michael Jordans, the Tom Brady's, all of these people, these movie stars. Even though if you look deep into many people's lives that are celebrities, they're the most shallow excuse of a life that ever existed. Divorces are standard. Multiple marriages and adultery, standard. Cheating people, standard. Lying, drug addiction, uh, all types of other addictions, Hashem Yachem, standard. Why would you want such a life? Oh, you think you'll be different? So did they. So one of the things that a person needs to understand is that by complying with the law of God, a person is doing themselves a service. They're not giving anything to God. God is perfect with or without you. Whether you exist or you don't, He is perfect. Whether you comply with the law or you don't, He is perfect. He does not need you, will never need you. By you following the law, you benefit. You are doing a service to yourself, but it's certainly not easy. Why? Because you have to fight your inner inclinations. You have to build your character, build who you are, because naturally you're coming into the fight with your hands behind your back. You're coming into the fight with two black eyes. You're coming into the fight with a few missing teeth. You're coming into the fight without realizing you're even in a fight. This is one of the most important messages that the Chazunish is telling us here today, where a person needs to know, in order to follow Allah, get ready to fight. Who? Yourself. Your inner inclinations that are evil. Your inner inclinations that are flawed. Your inner inclinations that like addiction because you don't realize the damage that it causes you. Whether it's drugs or it's women or it's this or it's that. All of these addictions are bad. One of the things that the Chazanish is trying to tell us here is that if we let the intellect rule, it will enhance our constant awareness of the importance of submitting to our inner sense and elevated conscious meaning when a person uses their intellect their intellect that's obviously comprised of truth their intellect that's comprised of facts not emotions not one-liners not shock jocks actual real information information that removes all emotions information that is as straight as an arrow information that's black or white correct or wrong information that's going to dictate what is right and what is wrong based on reality not based on some emotion and some popularity contest when a person uses that information uses their intellect this is going to help them elevate that inner conscience that part of god that god put in you when he blew a neshama into adam Rishon, that part will start lighting up that part will be the dominating force in your life that part is going to make you a much more spiritual person because you're acting accordingly. But if a person acts according to their emotions, then the difference between you and some cow in Arkansas is nothing. The difference between you and some pig in Texas, nothing. The difference between you and some terrorist, nothing. The difference between you and some anti-Semite, nothing. Why? It's all emotional based. It's all emotional based. 
and it's irrelevant of whether a person is Jew or Gentile in this regards. This is one of the most important aspects of it. These are things that are relevant to all of mankind. These are relevant to all of mankind. If a person will elevate himself through the truth of the Torah itself, that person will arrive at a much better destination than they can possibly imagine. But if they don't, their destination is doomed. There is no second place that's good. There is no second place. It's either amazing or it's a nightmare. There is no in-between. There's no gray area. No gray area in life. There's no gray area in eternity. It's either a person has an amazing life or a person has one tragedy after another with a few breaks in between. And the Chazunish continues and he says the following. If the meticulousness in halacha and observing the laws of the Shukhan Aruch are easier to accommodate and more effective in refining one's character traits in general, they are also a cure for all corrupted traits in particular. What are we saying here? What are we saying here? Well, let's see. We'll build it up and then we'll go back. We'll build it up and then we'll go back. For instance, the habit of patience is a cure for anger and taking offense. The habit of quickness is a cure for laziness and indifference. The habit of accepting the ridicule of others is the cure for seeking honor. One who is particular in his actions acquires a great and strong trait of endless love for being particular. This love will enable him to despise all his opponents even though those opponents are childhood friends, namely the group of bad traits that he delighted in as a child. Meaning childhood friends is not people, but rather it's the inner traits that you've had your whole life. So let's see, let's dissect it, let's go into it. Be'ezrat Hashem Na'asev and Atzliach, trying to figure out how we can use our age-old teachings of the Holy Torah and apply it to our lives to make it a better world, Be'ezrat Hashem. Now, the difference between refining yourself and removing the corruption altogether seem minuscule, but they're a world apart. When a person was born with a trait of anger, they're a hothead. They're inclined to get angry, not only quickly, but really angry. They get aggressive. They break stuff, they yell, the neighbors hear, all types of things. Once that person starts learning Torah, they realize that anger has no business in a religious person's life. Anger has no business in a servant of Hashem. But of course, just stopping anger is not possible, just like it's not possible to stop anything that you've grown up doing your whole life. So a person will start learning Musar, developing their character, following more of the laws, following the laws that require you to wake up early in the morning, to go pray, the law that requires you to be clean behind closed doors, outside of closed doors, the laws that require you to be generous with your money, not with other people's money, the laws that require you to be honest when people see you and when people don't see you, the laws that are the laws of Judaism. All of the different details, not just the Sabbath and the holidays and eating kosher, but everything else. When a person starts observing more and more of them, little by little, he will find himself getting angry less often and on fewer things. If he continues to work on himself, that anger will ultimately dissipate into nothing. Why? Because the more a person is observant of the law, the more a person is going to learn about it and become more observant and apply it to their life in such a fashion that this becomes their mission in life, then that person is going to develop a closer connection with their creator, where they realize that they're en od milvado, that there's nothing else but him. Meaning that when a person comes to you and tells you something that would typically make you upset, instead of getting upset, you become a small version of King David, where Shimi ben Gera came and cursed him a klalanim retzet. Klalanim retzet is a multiple curses. He called him a child out of wedlock, a murderer, an adulterer, and so on and so forth. Several different curses he cursed him, but not only cursed him, 
He cursed him in front of his entire army. And instead of killing him, King David says, God told him to curse me. Meaning, if I didn't deserve what he said, God wouldn't allow it. He wouldn't, he wouldn't allow it to happen. That means that instead of being upset at him for cursing me, I have to investigate myself to see why do I deserve this? Why do I deserve this? Because if I didn't deserve it, certainly this wouldn't happen. Now, of course, this is a elevated level that's beyond our comprehension. But the point still is that a person that is more observant of the Torah and its laws is going to connect to God in such a fashion where they realize that everything is from Him. That flat tire is from Him. That raise you got at the job is from Him. Got fired, that's from Him. You had a kid, that's from Him. You got married, that's from Him. Divorced, that's also from Him. Your friend spoke about you behind your back, that's from Him. You lost money in the stock market, that's from Him. You just got an inheritance of zillions of dollars. That's also from him. Everything is from him. And Od Milvado, there's nothing else but him. Therefore, if this person or this thing or whatever event out there is in front of me, is facing me, is attacking me, that's also him. Why should I be upset at him? Why should I be upset at him? Instead of being upset at him or her or them, let me connect to him. Let me see, let me investigate myself and figure out where did I go wrong in order to deserve this? Now, it could be that this is a test and a test only, or it could be this is a rebuke or both. But nonetheless, the more connected I am to the Creator, the more I understand that there is never a reason to be angry. Why? It's all from Him. By being angry, that means I am giving power to a different entity. Hence the reason why the Gemara, the Talmud, the Holy Talmud tells us a person that expresses their anger by throwing something, by ripping something, by an aggressive way, you could already consider this person an idol worshiper. Why an idol worshiper? Because he's already following the ways of the Satan. Where today he tells him this, he does this. Tomorrow he tells him that, he's going to do that. He follows the Satan. So one day the Satan is going to tell him, go worship an idol. He's going to worship an idol too. Because that's the ultimate destination of the Satan. That's where he wants to take everybody. So a person needs to understand. If you express your anger at somebody else, that means you're giving that entity, that person, some form of power that's separate from God above. Chas v'shalom. You're not allowed to be angry. Needless to say, it is literally almost 100% idolatry to a certain extent. Why? You're giving a different entity power. Now, of course, most normal people don't do this intending to go against God. But this is indeed the actual act. So a person needs to understand if you are going to be a servant of God, you have to work on these things. You have to overcome these things. And by following the law, by following the law of God, a person little by little will refine themselves to the point of destroying the evil that's within them altogether. Meaning it's not only for the sake of refining the law, but actually curing the corrupted trait altogether and removing it because a person that has 100% emuna, 100% faith in the Creator, realizing that everything is from Him, that person will never be angry once in their life. That person will never be arrogant once in their life. That person will never be stingy once in their life. That person will never be sad for a second in their life. That person is literally living as if they're in heaven already now. Why? They're connected to the one and only above and they know everything is from Him. Now, of course, we're not on that level, but we certainly can aspire. It's much more admirable to aspire to become that even if you are a world away from being a perfect person than aspiring to become some guy that shoots a basketball or some guy that plays in movies and some guy that's here today, gone tomorrow, eaten by the maggots and the worms. A person should aspire to be holy, not aspire to be rich in material that's here today, gone tomorrow. Material that's given to him or taken from him by God himself. This is one of the flaws in society that we have today. 
People aspire to be things that are temporary. People aspire to be things that are most likely unholy. Of course, each one of us has multiple things. We all have a few missing limbs, a few missing R, a few missing this, a few missing that. We all have a few things. None of us only has one thing to work on in our whole life. But you can't work on everything in one day. But guess what? The beauty of the Holy Torah is that once you start working on something, as you improve it, the other things come along for the ride too. That's the beauty. That's the beauty. I remember when we used to be uh, kids playing football and lifting weights and all that stuff. And one of the things that the coaches always pushed is for the athletes to do squats. And we always wondered, you know, as kids, what do we need to do squats? Let's do bench pressing. Let's do dumbbells. Let's do this. Let's do that. And a lot of times you'd see guys that are bodybuilders. They're huge on top, but they have little chicken legs. They have little chicken legs. Now, if you ever had a uh, competition, there was ever a competition of strength between that guy and a guy that's perhaps even half his size, but still physically fit, the guy that's half his size would usually win. And the reason why is because when a person has strength in his legs, the rest of the body gets stronger. Needless to say, the same concept is here. Person has to continue working. And if they want to completely eradicate all of the corruption that's within them, it's going to require an ongoing lifelong process. This is the ultimate purpose of a person individually. That's what the Gaumi Vilna says 200 or so years ago. That if a person came to this world and did not fix their character flaws, for what were they created? Meaning they did not achieve their purpose. Meaning even if they came here and they observed Shabbat and they ate kosher and they uh, gave tzedakah and they did nice things, but they still remained that corrupted person inside. There's still that arrogant person. There's still that stingy person. There's still whatever it is that's within them. Nothing has changed there. They haven't completed their mission. They haven't completed their mission. Why? That's what you were created for. That's what you were created for. So a person that is meticulous in halacha and observing the law of the Shuchan Aruch are easier to accommodate and more effective in refining one's character traits in general. They're also a cure for all corrupted traits in particular. And now he gives us a few examples. The first one he says, the habit of patience is a cure for anger and taking offense. If a person is patient, imagine having some more patience. Today, patience is like a fantasy. The average person does not even know what patience looks like. They think that if they send a text message and you don't respond, the second that they know that you've seen that text or the computer tells them or the phone tells them they saw a text because there's a little check mark next to the message they sent you and you don't respond right away, that means that, oh, you don't want to respond you hate them, you're ignoring them, uh, you're, you're, you're dodging them, uh, you're, you're, you have some type of uh, uh, plot against them, whatever it is, like people have all these crazy thoughts. Why? Because their patience simply does not exist. Their patience doesn't exist. They expect immediate relief for whatever pain they have. And this thought process of wanting instant gratification is the ultimate generator of most of people's pain today. Again, people want immediate relief to their pain. Their pain, which is their lack of patience. They want immediate relief. They want an immediate response, an immediate answer to whatever question they have. That desire to have immediate relief and lack of patience, in fact, Instead of giving them immediate relief, it creates more pain than you can possibly imagine. Why? Because they want that relief and it's impossible to ever live up to that. It's impossible for anybody to live up to that, to give them that constant relief. They're forced to, number one, constantly look for different sources of relief, a never-ending chase of their own tail. 
They're constantly looking for new friends, new spouses, new jobs, new this, new that, new food, new favorite, new hated, new this, constant new. Nothing is ever enough. Why? They want immediate. And this is not immediate, but it used to be immediate. Yeah, it didn't slow down on me. Are you sure it slowed down or you, uh, you sped up? I don't know. It's just not good. It's just not good. It's never good. Nothing's ever good. And they move on and on and on. It's constant replacement. Constant replacement. They cannot stay at a single job for more than a few months or a year. They cannot stay at a single relationship for more than a little while. They cannot stay with anything for an extended period of time. Why? Because they want something that does not exist. They think life is a computer. Life is Google. That's what happened to them. This is the reason why companies like TikTok and, and Twitter and all these companies that have short little tidbits, that's why it's succeeding because people literally have programmed themselves. It's not society programming them. It's not uh, the government programming them. It's they programmed themselves to want immediate relief and actually expect it. And when they don't get it, they replace it with something else. This is why companies like Facebook and other social medias, they're not long-term companies. These are companies that are literally obsolete, literally the day after they're created. Why? Their time in this world, if they stay the same, is gone. They're, they're not gonna stay. Why? Because people, people are not going to be happy with the same thing. They're not going to be happy with the same thing. They'll be happy for a little while until something else fits their needs. What about the relationship you have with this company? That million and a half posts you made over the last five, 10 years. Oh yeah, that was fun. Okay, next. That's it. No qualms about it. Everything becomes MySpace. Everything becomes old technology. Everything becomes DOS, Atari. Everything becomes Commodore 64 and a bunch of things that probably some of you don't even know existed because you're so young. Needless to say, these are things that we have programmed ourselves for this immediate gratification generation. And unfortunately, this immediate gratification generation is the most depressed generation in history, even though materially it's the wealthiest generation in history. If you look at the lives of our forefathers 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 400 years ago, poverty was standard. Poverty was standard, but people were happy. Today, wealth is standard. Today, success is standard. Today, every neighborhood has some winners. Every neighborhood has somebody that made it. Every neighborhood has something, but yet misery everywhere. Divorce everywhere. Hatred everywhere. Why? Why? Because people feel like they need to be satisfied immediately. This is the reason why they cannot have successful relationships, successful marriages, successful parenting. They expect their kids to be grown up at three years old. They expect their wife to be some computer machine at the same time some model they saw on some filthy internet site. They expect their husband to be some money machine, some uh, uh, patience machine, some psychiatrist, psychotherapist, and psychologist all at one, and at the same time to be some movie star too. They expect all of these things right away, and when they don't get it, it's only a matter of time before they replace it. And it's the reason why divorce lawyers are making a fortune. Divorce lawyers are making a fortune. The wedding hall should be shut down. Why should you turn them into divorce halls? It's literally a tragedy, but it's a tragedy that's self-inflicted. Society at large is inflicting itself. We are people that are creating our own depression simply because we have no patience. We want immediate gratification. So the first thing we do, we constantly look for replacement. Replace, 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 everything replace. Then after that, when it's not possible to replace, what do we do? We start delving into it. Why is he not responding? Why didn't they call me back? Why didn't they respond to my email? Ah, oh, they probably don't want to do business with me. Ah, oh, she probably cheating on me. Ah, oh, probably uh, it's conspiring against me. Ah. Oh, they're probably this, they're probably that, and all the thoughts, and all the suffering, all of the thoughts are negative. Nobody gives the benefit of the doubt to the other party. Nobody gives the benefit of the doubt. They can watch a million and a half lectures about Nahumish Gamzu and the Baal Shem Tov giving the benefit of the doubt, and Kaf Schut, and benefit of the doubt, and while they're watching it, they're not giving somebody else the benefit of the doubt. Oh, he didn't respond? Yeah, he probably, he probably went the other way. Probably went the other way. Hey, he probably hates me. Oh, he probably this. He's probably cheating. Probably that. Constant negativity. 
And what ends up happening? Nine out of ten times they're wrong. But yet they suffered as if they were right the whole time. They suffered because in their mind, this person is cheating, this person is lying, this person is going behind their back, this person is ignoring them intentionally, this person hates them, this person is this, and they're suffering in their head. Ooh, and if a person is not a busy person and all they have in their life is just a few contacts, a few different things, all the amount of suffering that's going on in their life. Why? Because they have all the time in a day to think all of the conjured up nightmare thoughts they can possibly imagine. Literally, the end is simply their imagination. And they will think every possible nightmare possibility that's out there. Cheated, lying, oh, they're part of the uh, FBI, or maybe it's the CIA, maybe they're part of the New World Order. Maybe, who are you talking about? The cleaning lady. What? The cleaning lady is part of the New World Order? What? Does it make sense? No, it doesn't make sense. The cleaning lady is part of the New World Order. No. What are you talking about? How did you get there? Oh, I don't know. She didn't respond to my text. When did you send her a text? Oh, like two minutes ago. We may need to institute you. Oh, so maybe you're part of the New World Order. Oh, you know how many people like this I know? People are psychopaths, but it's all self-inflicted. You can't even help them. Only the Holy Torah can help them. And only if they accept it on themselves that what I believe, my predisposition, is wrong. I have to fix myself. I have to fix myself. When something doesn't happen right away, that is normal. If he doesn't respond, if she doesn't respond, whether in time or at all, that's normal. That's normal. The immediate gratification mentality is abnormal. Is abnormal. And a person that expects the world to dance to their tune without an end is a person that is constantly going to suffer. All of the worst thoughts that can possibly exist will go into their head about every one of their relationships, which means they will actually not only self-destruct, but they'll also destroy the relationships without anything ever happening. Do you ever have one of those relationships where all of a sudden the person doesn't answer you anymore? You send a message, you were friends already for a year, two years, three years, whatever it is, five years, and all of a sudden you send a message, they don't respond to you. Okay, maybe they didn't get the message. Hopefully, you're a normal person, not crazy. Oh, they didn't get the message. Okay, fine. Send a message a week later, or if you're a psychopath, five minutes later, still don't respond. Oh, maybe their phone broke. Okay. A week later, probably fixed their phone by now. Send another message. Still don't respond. Oh, maybe they, they, they don't have money to buy the phone. I'll send them an email. Surely they have an email. They have an email at work. Send an email. Hey, how are you doing? They don't respond to the email either. Oh, maybe my email went to uh, spam. Okay, so uh, you know what? Let me just, uh, if I see him, if I see him at, uh, usually he likes to go there. He's like, oh, I'll see him at synagogue. And you see them and they see you and they sometimes don't even say hello. Sometimes they do, but they walk past you as if you, they don't really know you. Do you ever have those relationships? You know how those things happen? They happen in people's minds. All of those things, those relationships that simply just, they're solid one day and gone the next, that all happened in somebody's mind. Where that person decided to end that relationship simply thought of all types of things, concluded a bunch of different things without verifying. They heard it either from somebody that has a big mouth that's full of lies and all types of other nasty things, or they simply thought it to themselves. They concluded to themselves and therefore they ended something that is unfixable. Unfixable. Why? Because even if they come back a year, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven years later, hey, by the way, listen, I'm sorry I haven't talked to you for the last five years. I thought that uh, you uh, did such and such, but actually, you know what? I just ran into that person. I asked them about it. They had no clue what I was talking about. So really, I was wrong. I'm sorry about that. Okay, thanks for the sorry, but I moved on with my life. So even the apology doesn't help. Why? You've destroyed it already. 
You've destroyed it already. How did you destroy it? In your mind. In your mind. Why? Because you wanted immediate gratification. You wanted immediate answers. You wanted immediate things. You had no patience to find the truth. You had no patience to verify. You had no patience to get to the bottom line. You had to get to a point now and you decided now and you decided wrong. These types of things happen all the time. People literally end relationships based on imagination. People end up destroying their lives, destroying all types of things based on things that don't exist. But this is a product of society that doesn't have Torah. Because had a person had the holy Torah in their life and submitted themselves to the law, things like this wouldn't happen. Somebody said, yeah, but I'm religious, but it still happened to me. Following Shabbat, observing Kashrut, being modest, doesn't necessarily make you uh, religious. It makes you observe it with Semit's vote. But to be here, to where the Chazonish is saying, that requires a lot more work. It requires a lot more work than just following a few laws. If you are deciding things based on emotions, if you are deciding things based on imagination, you have a long way to go. Long. And this Rabotai is the vast majority of society today. The media is based on emotions. Headlines are thought of based on emotions. What's going to get the biggest emotional uh, response? That's how they decide what's going to be on the front page. That's how they decide what's going to be the title of a book or, or a title of a news report or title of a video or title of anything. What's going to get the most likes? What's going to get the most clicks? What's going to get the most reaction? Even if it's not true. Even if it's not true, even if it's going to destroy lives, what's going to get us the most emotion? And a person that is a product of society rather than a product of God is simply causing themselves to be a victim. No one is causing you to be a victim. You choose that life. You cannot blame the media. You cannot blame the government. You cannot blame society. You have to blame yourself. Why? You're in charge of your life. Just like you are in charge of putting your pants on one leg at a time. You're in charge of whether you're modest or not. You're in charge of whether you eat, when you eat. You're in charge of where you work, why you work, who you work for. You're in charge of all of those things. You're a big boy, you're a big girl, you're a big person. You decide for yourself. For this, you also have to decide yourself. What's the purpose of your life? Who do you listen to? If you decide you're going to listen to terrorists like Farrakhan, that's your choice. That's your choice. If you decide you're going to listen to the Holy Torah, that's also your choice. That's also your choice. If you decide you're going to insult based on rumors, that's your choice. If you're going to attack based on fact, that's also your choice. What are you going to do? So the holy sages are teaching us things rather than preaching to us. Where they're telling us there are certain tools that you have at your disposal that will help you relieve so much pain from your life where if a person uses the Torah in order to develop patience that patience that patience will alleviate the pain you have from anger the pain you have from taking things in a negative way taking offense so many people get offended by the smallest things. Oh, you mentioned black. I'm black. Did I insult black? No, but you said it. Okay, so what, what should I say? Brown? Burgundy? Yellow? Dark orange? Green? What? What do you want me to say? Say African American. But you're not from Africa. Okay, but you still considered that. Okay, fine. Oh, you said uh, homosexual. Okay, what do you want me to say? Toiva, disgusting, filth. What do you want me to tell you? Someone that does things the wrong way, the opposite way. What, what do you want me to say? No, you should say LGBTQA, ABCDEFG. I'm never going to say that. To remember it is already it requires a certain amount of brain power I don't want to use. But people get offended. People get offended by the smallest, dumbest things in the world. Why are you getting offended? Oh, you spoke to me this way. How did I speak to you? You raised your voice. Was I insulting to you? No, but you raised your voice. That's my tone of voice. 
Yeah, but why can't you speak lower? I don't know. It's not the way that I speak if I'm passionate about something. Oh, that's offensive. You can't help it. You can't, you can't appease these people. They're offended by everything. Today, people are offended by what they choose to be offended. Yesterday, if you said anything against the Holocaust, that was offensive. Today, no problem. Yesterday, if you said anything about, uh, you know, a uh, homosexuals, this was something that, uh, you know, it's not a problem, normal, to be against homosexual. Today, you're uh, banned, corrupt, uh, you know, practically uh, lynched in society. How could you be against homosexuals? Yeah, but throughout all of history, every civilization has been against homosexuals, including the homosexuals. So today, things are a little bit upside down. A person that works on themselves, works on themselves in such a way where they develop patience. That patience will be the cure for their anger and for their taking offense. Why? If you're patient, you're gonna let time do its job. And you'll see that most things that would naturally make you upset, if you let time do its, do its thing, you'll see that it actually worked out better than you thought. He didn't call you back, not because he was ignoring you. He didn't call you back because he was making calls on your behalf in order to give you good news by the time he called you back. You see, they didn't respond to your email, not because they don't care about what you have to say. They didn't respond because the email went to spam and only after they ran into you in the streets and they asked you, how you doing? I'm still waiting for your message. And you say, I sent you a message three days ago. And they ask you, when? Let me check. And they check right in front of you and they see that your message went to spam. And you see, wow, this, this was all a misunderstanding. You, you went to, a, you know, you didn't get the message. Can't be mad at somebody who didn't get the message. When you let time do its thing, you'll see that really the anger was wrong to begin with. And even more so, when it comes to taking offense, if you have patience, you'll see that most people don't intend to offend you. If you pay attention to what they're trying to tell you, you'll see that they're not really trying to offend you. There's usually people that are trying to offend you are much more direct. They don't beat around the bush. They don't play games. They usually are pretty direct. And if they're not direct, it usually means that they're not trying to offend you. If anything, they're trying to help you. So a person that will work on his patience will ultimately benefit in becoming less angry with people that are beloved to them and also just people that are co-workers and otherwise. Whereas if a person that continues to be impatient, that means that they're going to be prone to anger at the most important people in their life. They're going to be offended by everything because no one can ever live up to their standards. No one could ever be a person that's going to be sufficient for them. And their lack of patience will be literally the water that is growing the plant of anger and, uh, and animosity in their life. Then the Chazoni says also, the habit of quickness is the cure for laziness and indifference. In this generation, one of the common traits that you have to work with, with young people, is that they're very lazy. This is not something that necessarily started now, but it's much more standard now. Where kids today have so much freedom with their time, and even kids from the previous generation that are now pretty much adults in their 20s and 30s, they have so much freedom with their time that they're prone to be lazy. They wake up whenever they want to wake up, they sleep whenever they want to sleep, and their lack of urgency is standard. They're never really like in a hurry. People literally are so lazy that it's hard to determine whether they're lazy because that's the way they are or they simply don't care. And the line between those two is very thin. Hence the reason why he's telling you that the quickness is a cure for both laziness and indifference. Because if a person is lazy, it doesn't necessarily always mean that he's indifferent. 
but it's most of the time it does mean that he doesn't really care. But if he's indifferent, he doesn't care, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's always lazy. But sometimes it does. Either way, if a person gets themselves used to just getting stuff done, it's in front of you, do it. Instead of being a procrastinator, instead of just being lazy, not doing it, just trying to enjoy life much more than be productive in life, then unfortunately this is the type of mentality that is very destructive for something that has a lot of potential. Where uh, this type of thought process is a uh, is, is bad but uh, if a person can fix it if a person can become quick uh, and just get things done right away that will naturally remove their inclination to be lazy because it's the exact opposite and even more so it's going to cause them to take things more seriously and not spend enough time to have an emotional stake in everything in order to determine whether they care or don't care because they're going to be too busy doing this is also one of the biggest differences between successful people and failures. You know, the people that fail are not necessarily always lazy bombs sitting in the streets. Many times the people that fail are not necessarily those people that uh, are in the streets. Many times they're people that work and they have regular jobs and they have regular lives and whatever it is, but they're still, according to their standards or whether what they wanted to get to, they're still considered failures. And the reason for that is because those people are typically too busy talking about what they want instead of doing what they need to do. Many people spend a lot of time talking about what they're gonna do once they have what they want and not spending enough time actually doing anything about it. So the person that is ambitious person, that's a go-getter, that gets stuff done, this is a person that is going to be much more likely to succeed than is friends and colleagues and society not because they're necessarily better at everything, but rather because they're constantly putting themselves in a position to succeed, where if success were possible, they would be the candidate. Whereas the other people that are slow to react or simply too lazy to react, or they're just lethargic or indifferent altogether, those people are not putting themselves in a position to succeed. Hence the reason why there are fewer people that succeed uh, versus the vast majority of people that don't. It's not because the skill level is that much better by the successful person versus the rest of society. It's usually because the tenacity, the ambition, the persistence, all of those key things, the key attributes of success are things that that person possesses, whereas the vast majority of society either does not possess any of them or too few of them or too little of some of them in order to put themselves in the right place at the right time. So the uh, person that is going to force themselves to wake up like a lion, go after whatever it is that's important to them, that person is going to cure their laziness and their indifference. So the Chazunish continues and he says the following. He says that the habit of accepting ridicule of others is the cure for seeking honor. This is against all logic. Why? Because today, Everybody has a voice. Everyone is Hollywood reporter. Everyone is Wall Street Journal reporter. As soon as they see something, they say something. You don't even need to advertise it anymore. They see something, everybody says, don't say anything, but they say it anyway. They report it on the internet. Everybody's a cameraman. Everybody has an opinion to say about something. Somebody said something on the internet. People feel like they need to make a video about it. People need to write an article about it. Everybody's a blogger. Everybody's a Twitter. Everybody's uh, some type of ter. So the logic of accepting ridicule is against human nature today. Why would I accept ridicule? Why would I accept people making fun of me? Why would I accept people criticizing me? In fact, if you look online for people that do get a good deal of ridicule, you'll see that either they completely ignore it or they build off of it. They build off of it by pretty much saying, we beat our haters, we overcame our haters. Our haters said we'll lose, we ended up winning. And they fight their haters, fire with fire. But this is not what it's saying here. It's not saying fight your haters, fire with fire. Quite the opposite. It says accepting ridicule of others as a cure for seeking honor. Meaning someone made fun of you, he called you a rabbit instead of a rabbi. 
He made fun of the way you look. He made fun of the way you dress. He made fun of the, the, the amount of money you have or you don't have. He made fun of your weight or whatever it is. He made fun of your thought. This, Rabotai, the logic we have today is that you fight back. What? I'm this, you're even worse. I'm that, you're even worse. I'm that, you're even worse. You know, to top each other. But the teaching here is not that. The teaching here is saying, oh, you just got insulted? What do you call you, fat? Well, you are fat. What, what do you call you, stupid? I mean, maybe according to him you are, maybe, maybe. What do you say, you're wrong? Okay, so he said you're wrong. Oh, he said that you're uh, not good at speaking? Oh, he said that you are uh, full of yourself? Okay, he said, he said, she said. Okay, so what? Why, why do you have to lose your cool? Why do you have to be sad? Why do you care? What do you mean? He said I'm this, he said I'm that. Okay, so he said, so what? Maybe it's true, and even when it's not true, so what? He said, air came out of his mouth and some voice came out. So what? Big deal. He said, you know the truth. If you're a liar, you know you're a liar. You don't need him to confirm you're a liar or not. And if he says you're a liar, you know you're not a liar. It doesn't make a difference if he says you're a liar. It's like somebody saying, the sky is burgundy. You know it's not. It's blue. Yeah, but he's yelling. So what is yelling? He's screaming. Why? He's insulting. Why? Why should a person be that type of reaction? Unmoved. Unfaced. Because a person needs to have a spine and know exactly where they stand with everything that they have, they stand for. And if you stand for something, you're worth something. But if you don't, you make yourself worthless. Meaning that everything that people are going to say about you is going to affect you. It's going to affect you in such a fashion that you're going to be so flexible to the point where you become elastic. Where one day you're gonna say this, the next day you're gonna say that. One day you're gonna say this, the next day you're gonna say that. You're gonna change with the mood. You're gonna change with the time. You're gonna change with the public opinion. You're gonna change with the likes. More likes, you're gonna say this. Less likes, you're gonna say that. And you're not gonna have your own personality, your own mindset, your own spine, your own anything. You're gonna become the product of society. Like the news, like the media. A sad excuse for a life. Whereas if you know where you stand, and you stand for something, then no one should really ever move you. And quite frankly, you should take all of those insults as, so what? At the end of it all, I know where I stand. I know what the truth is. They can agree, disagree, fine. If there's some type of validity to what they're saying, certainly a person should review it. But if you know that the sky is blue, as much as you know that the sun is gonna shine tomorrow, them saying it's green or it's burgundy is not gonna change anything. If you know that God said this, and they're saying otherwise, it doesn't make a difference what they're saying. It doesn't make a difference who says it. You know exactly what's true and that's it. Now even more so, if a person develops themselves to the point where they accept this ridicule and they accept the world calling them crazy, then that's gonna help them become more humble over time. Why? Because if a person is not looking for compliments, but rather just looking for the truth, then eventually they can arrive at the most extraordinary level that they could possibly get to. A level of equality, emotional equality, which is viewing both compliments and ridicule the same. Meaning, neither one of them affect you. You're not doing anything that you're doing for the sake of compliments, and you're not going to be affected by the negativity either. You're doing things because this is the right thing to do. You're doing things because this is what you believe in. Not because you're looking for money or fame or fortune or any type of praise. You're not looking for a big chazaku baruch and a high five and wow, you're a genius and wow, you're amazing and wow, you're beautiful. You're not looking for any of that. And in fact, you get to a point where whether they tell you you're beautiful or you're ugly, to you it's the same. It doesn't make a difference. Now, the average person in the society today says, well, I want people to say that I'm beautiful. Okay, I feel bad for you that you're at that level, that you need society's approval to know whether you are good or not. No, I need them to know that I'm attractive. Why? The only person that need needs to find you attractive is your spouse. Everybody else doesn't matter. 
And in fact, it's better that they don't find you attractive so it doesn't give you any bad, strange ways and bad, strange decisions. But the average person in society doesn't think that way. The average person in society needs society's approval. Hence the reason why this is so opposite of what our logic is. Accepting ridicule? And that's going to end up with a cure for seeking honor? Yes. Yes. Many times, the people that unfortunately were taught to hate the Jews from the African-American society, community, culture, are taught that the Jews had better opportunities while we were in the projects. They came for money. We didn't have anything. They this, they run the world. I'll spare you the rest. I'm sure you've heard enough on your own. Now, this is hogwash. Why? First and foremost, no one in the world, even if you combine all of civilizations combined, can compete with the amount of suffering and anguish of the Jewish people throughout all of history, not just the last 70 years, and needless to say, not over the last couple of hundred years. Throughout all of history, there is no comparison. Anyone that looks throughout history will know that to be fact. Whether it was the slavery in Egypt or the destruction and annihilation of millions of people during the destruction of the first temple or the second temple, or the Spanish Inquisitions, or the pogroms throughout all of history, whether it be in England, or in Spain, or in uh, Morocco, or all over Europe, constant attacks against the Jewish people. Not just the Holocaust. But even if you exclude all of that, the average Jew throughout all of history got used to poverty as a standard. Throughout all of history, the Jewish people as a whole have dealt more with poverty than with wealth. Certainly there were times where we were more successful than others, like any other culture, religion, people, whatever you want to call it, because the Jews are everything. But needless to say, there were times like the time of Shlomo HaMelech where gold became like dust because there was so much of it. But there were certainly times where literally people had to eat their own kids in order to survive. Like at the destruction of the first and the second temple. The starvation was beyond anything comprehensible to anybody living today. Poverty was standard. Now people think, yeah, but that's a long time ago. Now everybody's rich. Okay, okay. How about I tell you about my life? You know, my life, you can't debate. Why? I lived it. When I was 10 years old, we came to the United States. And already when I was 10 years old, guess what? I was in fifth grade, gonna go to school. In my school, public school, there was black kids, there was white kids. And in this school, there was two people that had a job. Ten years old. Me and another Jewish kid. Why? Because both of us were poor. Both of us needed to help the family. Yeah, but what about the other black kids? They also didn't have, no, actually they had much more than us. They had new sneakers every six months. They had new clothes every other day. Apparently, their parents were doing better than mine. And guess what? Situation didn't change. We continued working. When I was in high school, I had three jobs. Two newspaper routes. Also worked in a clothing store and a shoe store. And I also played high school football and went to school and had advanced placement uh, classes uh, uh, for college and did really well in school, all at the same time. My teammates, they were black, 
They played football. You know what else? Nothing. How come I work so much? Well, that's because if I didn't work, I couldn't pay for football because my parents didn't have any money to pay for football. And if I didn't work, I also couldn't buy anything else because my, my parents didn't have any money to give me for anything else. Meaning I have to be self-sufficient. And guess what? I wasn't the only one. There were other kids in my class that were similar. And they were Jews. And guess what? Even the kids that didn't need, didn't need, sometimes will take some extra jobs. And typically those guys were Jews. Sometimes they were Spanish guys, but most of the time, Jews. You know why? Because the way we grew up, even though we didn't grow up religious, we grew up where we realized we had to be self-sufficient. And we didn't dream for a second that we're going to become the next big athlete or the next big anything. We knew we had to be providing to the best of our abilities. Now, the guys on my team, some of them were really good. Trevor Francis, Zarek Norris, the uh, LT, we called him Lawrence Taylor. He even looked like him. All these guys were really good, really good athletes. Some of the, some other guys, I forget their names. These guys were good. Some of them played in college. Some of them thought they're gonna become the next big NFL player. You know what they ended up becoming? Nothing. Some of them even less than nothing. Why? Because that was their dream. And their entire dream was to be this football player. Which means that they were brought up with a thought process that this is it. This is where you need to be. You need to think like you're going to be an NFL player. You need to think you're going to be in the NBA. You need to think like you're going to be uh, in uh, whatever, some other sport. And when it didn't happen, like it doesn't happen for the vast majority of athletes, they have nothing to fall back on because many times they're not brought up thinking that the education is priority over the athletics. And sometimes the teachers give them an A, even though he should get an F because he's a good athlete. They give him a pass even though he failed and he never even showed up to class because he just scored a touchdown or he scored a bunch of points in the basketball team or he scored a goal in a hockey team or in a soccer team or some other team. And many times they abandon their studies. And many times they end up leaving school completely clueless when it comes to learning how to think for themselves because that's the purpose of school. Purpose of school is not to teach you history. It's not even to teach you math. It's to teach you how to think. But since everybody has been thinking for them their whole life, telling them that you're gonna become the next big sports athlete, what ends up happening when they don't succeed, they have nothing to fall back on. They either have to stay in college for extra amount of time or they end up getting some blue collar job that quite frankly, they should have done better than that had they spent the same amount of energy on their studies as they did on their body and their athletics. This is not a product of Jew versus black. This is a part of society at large where Shlomo HaMelech already told us about this nearly 3,000 years ago. This danger, this poison, is a product of society already for several thousand years. It's as old as time. Where Shlomo HaMelech says in chapter 27, verse 21, a refining pot is for silver and a crucible for gold, and a man according to his praises. Here, King Solomon tells us a very important message. A person can think, oh, silver, that's something to aspire to have. Gold is even better. And all they talk about is the gold and the silver and the title 
and the winning and the house and the car and the watch and the bling bling and the bling there and the hot girl and the cold one and the this and the that and all the materialism and the constant that's their life and that's what they think and that's what they want and that's what they aspire to be you aspire something that's what tells me who you are based on who you aspire to be based on what you aspire to be based on what you admire what you think is important enough to admire that's how i know who you are and if society teaches kids black white green jewish gentile doesn't make a difference if you are taught and you allow this to happen to you happen to your kids that you should admire success based on money success based on looks success based on some type of possessions that's what tells me who you are and what that is is you're nothing why because those things end up being nothing if you determine what your goals are in life based on assets based on a balance sheet that's what you think makes you who you are you're a nothing you're a zero and you're breeding zeros it has nothing to do with the jews it has to do with you going against the law of god because god told you don't do that god told you don't admire those things those things i'll give you if i want i don't give you if i don't want don't make those things your life. Why? Because when you make material possessions, honor, fame, fortune, the, the, the aspiration of your life, you're destined for doom. Because what ends up happening is that you teach your little cute kids that have all the potential in the world to succeed. Jew or Gentile, black, white, green, or, or burgundy. Whatever you are. That little kid, that little possession, that little treasure has all of the potential in the world to be whatever they want. They could be a doctor, they could be a, 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 a diagnostician, a scientist, a scholar, whatever you want them to be. They could be a great rabbi, a sage, someone holy. They could be anything you want them to be, but they could also be a criminal. They could also be a gangster. They could also be a blood or a crip. They could also be a, some Arab terrorist in ISIS. They could also be some delusional person that thinks there's a real country named Palestine. They could be a lot of different things. You see, what you teach them, that's what they're gonna be. But I don't mean the material, the content that you teach them in some public school that teaches the boys they should be girls and the boys should be girls. No, no, no. I mean, what you teach them, what should they admire? What should they admire? How would they know what to admire? I'll tell you how they know what to admire. You see, since we learn about HaKadosh Baruch Hu, since we connected our life and committed ourselves to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and spent every waking moment we possibly can just thinking about Hashem, learning His Torah, learning His books, learning His everything. One of the things that I realized, there was one thing, one thing that I had to fix with, with my kids, with the rest of my life, is that, yes, you need to work hard. Yes, you need to be self-sufficient. But at the same token, you need to make sure that you have the right ideology that you teach your kids to admire the right people and the right things. And even though I've always stood for righteousness, I've always stood for, for honesty, I've always stood for certain things that Baruch Hashem are good, but still, I needed somebody to admire, somebody to look up to. Because who am I going to tell my kids to admire? Who am I going to tell the kids to admire? So Bill Gates? Uh, Warren Buffett? Some guy that's here today, gone tomorrow, maybe he's a rapist, maybe he's a pedophile, maybe he's a terrorist. How can I tell him what? Because he has possessions? I need somebody to admire. A Kadosh Baal who gave us an endless supply of people to admire. And that's the Jewish sages. Those are the people that taught us righteousness. Those are the people that tell us the word of God. And you know what? Every night, every single night, without fail, Baruch Hashem, we try our best to tell our kids another story about somebody to admire. So one night, we'll read them this book about Rav Steinemann, where it has many, many different stories about Rav Steinemann's life, how holy he was, how committed he was, how many people he helped, 
how extraordinarily committed he was to learning, how extraordinarily committed he was to helping society, to helping the Jewish people, to helping anyone that needed a hand that he could help, how honest he was. When he didn't necessarily have to give, he still gave. When someone thought something bad about him, he accepted it. All of the attributes that we talked about today, he had in his hand. This is one person my kids will learn about. But if that's not enough, you need more. So you have another one, you have the Chazonish, the very same Chazonish that we're learning his book right now. What about his life? A few stories about his life. So they learn about him. After we finish that, we read about the Chafetz Chaim, the holy Chafetz Chaim, that had Ruach HaKodesh, that he saw that the Holocaust was happening and told his students the Holocaust would happen nine years before it actually happened. The holy Chafetz Chaim, and how committed he was. At the second that he saw that his little shop, his little store, his little deli was making too much money where the other stores weren't making enough he closed the store he closed the store why because the other stores weren't making enough money so he closed the store because you know people are coming to him too much to buy him because he's a tzaddik so he closed the store and he only opened it once a week but he, when he saw that people are still coming to him even that once a week and not enough to the other people he closed the store completely i'll survive another way i'll sell my books why because he didn't want to hurt his neighbor what do you mean but you need to make a living Yes, exactly. I need to make a living. God will worry about that. God will worry about that. Your kids hear a story like this that gives them strength to overcome things, overcome obstacles, overcome naysayers, overcome all types of things that a person is going to deal with during their life. They have somebody to look up to. They have somebody that they can compare this story to that story. Some difficulty to compare it to. Our job is to be a light to the nations. Light to the nations doesn't mean that we walk around with a light bulb on our head. Light to the nations means we follow the Torah, follow the rules of the Torah, and that creates light everywhere. While the Romans and the Greeks trained their kids to be warriors, we trained our kids to be tzaddikim. While the Spaniards trained their kids to be warriors, we trained our kids to be tzaddikim. While the Nazis trained their kids to be warriors, we trained our kids to be tzaddikim. While the Americans trained their kids to be celebrities, we trained our kids to be tzaddikim. While the Israelis are teaching their kids to be soccer players and celebrities, we're teaching our kids to be tzaddikim. And yes, Israelis, they're Jews, but unfortunately they're not all religious. You see, Rabotai, if you train your kids to admire losers, you've made the decision for them. There are many people that are among our brothers, our sisters, our Jewish brothers and sisters that don't comply with the Torah. And guess what? They're living the same life as everybody else. Materialistic, purposeless, and unfortunately troublesome. So this also goes out to them because they also teach their kids to admire false leaders, admire materialism, Admire things that are purposeless instead of admiring something with a purpose. One of the most awful things that American Jews have admired over the last 70 years is the Israeli army. And literally, the sages, the Jewish sages, cried out tears of blood against this over the last 70 years. So much so that when they said that girls have to be drafted, also the sages told Am Yisrael, Chazonish, and others, this is die but not sin, meaning to send your daughter to the Israeli army or any army, it's better to die than to do that. Unfortunately, the warped mentality of American Judaism that is very connected at times with Zionism, and I'm not talking about the uh, just the secular Zionists, although that's the majority, but rather also some modern Orthodox or what they call religious Zionists cared less about what the Jewish sages said and electively, electively would send their American daughters and sons to the Israeli Defense Force, to the Israeli army. Now to send your son is stupid. Why? Israel doesn't need any more soldiers from America. They have enough from Israel, especially since it's a mandatory draft. But needless to say, you wanna do it, by all means, do it. Stupid, but you can do it if you want. 
especially if that's what your son was taught, that he should do it. But to send your daughter, that's suicide. That's going against the sages, and it's bound to cause problems. Now, of course, many people ignored Chazonish, many people ignored Lobovadia, many people ignored all of the sages that spoke against this, thinking that they know better. Well, a recent report came out that the one out of four, one out of four women in the, uh, the serving in the uh, prison or the police in Israel has been sexually attacked in some way or another, raped, or molested, or otherwise. The amount of abortions that are made in the Israeli Defense Force is a national secret they will refuse to release because there are so many. The amount of girls that are being raped in the Israeli army, in the police force, is no different than what's happening in America and other countries that allow women to serve. So if they were forced to go in there and there's nothing you can do about it, that's one thing. But to go send your daughter to the Israeli army is simply sending your daughter to go get raped. That's what you're doing. Where does that start with? By making the Israeli Defense Force, by making Ben Gurion, by making all of the Zionists your heroes, that led to your daughter's rape. That's what led to your daughter's rape. It has nothing to do with the rabbi. It has nothing to do with the religious community. In fact, it doesn't even have anything to do with the army. It has to do with the parenting. The parenting and the upbringing that you had your kid. And this is all public reports. You can double check every single word that I said. And that's what the Chazonish finishes up with and says, one who is particular in his actions acquires a great and strong trait of endless love for being particular. This love will enable him to despise all his opponents, even though those opponents are childhood friends namely the group of bad traits that he delighted as a child. When a person decides that I'm going to go in the way of a Torah, I'm putting everything on the line. Doesn't matter what it says. Doesn't matter if I understand. Doesn't matter if I grew up this way or I grew up that way. I know it's true. I'm going after it. I'm going to try my best. I fail. I'm going to try again. I fail. I try again. I fail. I try again, but I'm going. I'm going. I'm going. I'm going. Person decides to go that way. They're guaranteed to succeed. And not only that, they're gonna fall in love with not only the results, but even the process itself. Because the more particular they are about the law, the more they'll fall in love with the law because they'll see results in their own life. They'll see the products, they'll see the fruits that are coming out of them. How they are with people, how they are under pressure, how they are with their kids, how they are with their spouse, how they are with their employees, how they are with their manager, how they are in society, how they are under all circumstances. They'll see the fruits from all of that. And when they see it, they'll fall in love with Hashem and His Torah even more. And the only thing that they will despise are the things that hold them back. Namely, their childhood friends, which are their evil traits that they grew up with, that are holding them back from reaching their full potential. So the shame, we will all succeed. הרבנים, הרב ירון ראובן, הרב אפרים כחלון, ראשי ארגון בעזרת השם, שהלכו בפי עליון, שעלו מעלה מעלה, יהיה להם ברכה והצלחה, הקדוש ברוך הוא ימלא בלשונות ליבם, לטובה ולברכה, שבכל אשר יפנו, יזכירו ויצליחו, יזכירו לעשות כאלה וכאלה, הודיעו תורה לאדירה, אמן ואמן.